Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Italian Institute of Culture and, of course, to the Italian Embassy. Um, I would like to start this evening by introducing Her Excellency Marangela Zappia, the Ambassador of Italy to the United States, who would like to share a few words with us. So, welcome. So, good evening to everyone and welcome to, to this embassy for this, uh, I have to say, very nice um, emotional occasion, at least for me, uh, which is the presentation of uh, the translation of the uh, Promessi Sposi by Michael Moore. Um, why emotional and, and why I'm here? Um, I, I shouldn't be here, but I, I want it even for five minutes. Uh, first of all, because Michael Moore is a friend. Um, we have met um, back in 1993, so a long time ago. Um, he was a young uh, interpreter and translator for uh, the Italian mission to the UN, and, uh, and I was borrowed from the consulate to the, <laughs> to the Italian mission for the General Assembly of the UN, and is there where, where we met. And since then, then we met again uh, in the beginning of 2000, and then more recently in, in 2018, when I was appointed as ambassador to the UN, and Michael was still there. Um, and I have these images of Michael in, uh, in our office, in our beautiful offices in, um, uh, on, on 48th uh, Street and, and 2nd Avenue, 49th floor. An amazing view, um, an office that I still miss in spite of the beauty of this embassy, uh, because New York is really at your feet. Um, and, and Michael was always there in his room, a sort of aquarium, um, and so I was going back and forth in, into the corridors, and Michael was there sometimes doing the translation job for, for the mission, but most of all um, with his stand and the Promessi Sposi on the stand, and he was there translating. And so from time to time I was, you know, curious. I stopped, I asked him where he was, what he was doing, uh, at what point of the this magnificent book that the um, Promessi Sposi of Alessandro Manzoni is, he was um, uh, working on. Um, and so I have these images and, uh, and I'm so happy that uh, from that work um, there is now this beautiful book that, uh, as you know, was presented in Italy in many different occasions um, and uh, is having a great success. And, uh, it's all deserved, Michael, and um, I really want to, uh, to say that um, in public uh, because you really deserve it. Um, I, I will leave to you know, people much, more, um, much better than me to explain how important uh, is this translation of the Promessi Sposi, a book that uh, any students in Italy um, has um, Le learned and, and read, uh, and, uh, and is really a, a fantastic book that Michael was able also with this translation to uh, bring to uh, a larger public um, here in the US. Uh, and I, I believe is the right moment really to read again this book. And we were talking while um, coming here to, uh, to the auditorium about, for instance, how chapter 19, <laughs> I will go back and read it again, uh, how chapter 19, for instance, is so relevant for diplomacy and, and how it's really a masterpiece of diplomacy, what's happening in that chapter. Um, in the same way, uh, there, are, there are really uh, many aspects of this book that um, after so many years are still so relevant uh, socially. So um, it's a great pleasure to, um, to, uh, you know, to open this uh, conversation um, and, uh, and I leave it to, to Michael and uh, to the other friends here to, uh, to really uh, present the book much better, better than I did. Michael, congratulations again for this. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, so once again, good evening, everybody. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of welcoming two guests who will guide us in the discovery of Manzoni's masterpiece. So of course, Dr. Michael Moore and Professor Armando Maggi. Let me start by thanking and introducing Dr. Michael Moore, 
who has a long-standing relationship with our country, as the ambassador just mentioned. And of course, he has published numerous translations across various genres, including this most recent uh, interpretation of I Promessi Sposi. I would also like to thank and introduce Professor Armando Maggi from the University of Chicago, an expert of Romance languages, author of multiple volumes and essays on Renaissance, Baroque, and modern culture. Professor Maggi is often engaged in finding innovative ways to promote literature among the youngest generations and will explore Manzoni's work and its importance today for Italian linguists, students, and literary connoisseurs. Uh, as usual, before we start, I would also like to thank the rest of the team of the Italian Cultural Institute for their efforts in organizing this event, as well as all of you for joining us. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our guest to the stage. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Valetra. Thank you, Ambassador Zafia. Um, you know, when I'm interpreting, the Italian speaker will often begin by saying, sono molto emozionato. And I always wondered how to translate it because everything seemed insufficient in English. It's not quite excited at so many things. And I am very emozionato. I think um, to be here, I think, in my nation's capital as an American. Um, to be here in Washington, this is the last stop of the sort of long tour I've been doing with the book which is being received so warmly uh, wherever I've gone uh, for different reasons. I was uh, just in Toronto in a community of immigrants, and they were very moved as we started talking about the Italian language and what it meant to them. Um, it, every place I've gone has been received very warmly and with great gratitude. For me personally, it is kind of a summation of my ex experience of it, uh, my professional life, really all that Italy has given me, all that Italy has taught me, the warmth with which I've been received, gratitude. It's sort of a, I don't know, in a way, a kind of expression of my gratitude. It's also sort of an expression of me, sort of, I was in Italy recently. I was in Italy two weeks ago, and I spoke at the Bradense Library right upstairs from where I had gone to school back in October 1975. And I could not stop thinking of who I was in 19 75, and of what Italy was. There I was, without much money and without much Italian, and in a very difficult time in Italian life, and in a school which was absolutely nothing like what I had expected. And I stuck it out. And it has been a very, very rewarding relationship, a very rewarding career. Part of me wants to say that I kind of capped it off with this, but then friends said, no, you have to keep going, and, and so I will. Um, Good news, actually, in addition to this, I've just been given a residency to translate the Storia della Colonna Infame, you know, which is coming next. And the publisher, what's beautiful also is that the reputation of the book is building slowly, surely, among people that read, among people that live, that love Italy, among people that have, among Italians that have maybe an American spouse or American children. It is sort of opening up this whole sort of chapter in this mirror, really, of in a way that would not have been possible. So really, thank you, thank you, thank you. The ambassador mentioned that uh, this past Monday was the 150th anniversary of Manzoni's death. And for the occasion, the president of the Republic of Italy, Sergio Mattarella, came to Milan, laid a wreath at the foot of Manzoni's tomb, but also then went to the Casa Manzoni, where I spent part of the time of writing the translation. And he gave a very interesting speech about the meaning of Manzoni today, maybe the meaning of the nation, the meaning of what he did for the Italian language. And he concluded with remarks which sort of dovetailed with things that I've been saying about And I translated them into English for you. And this will be our starting point. Reading the betrothed always reserves new surprises because of its refinement, its wit, its depth, the vividness of its descriptions, and the psychological treatment of its character. I wish to add a final aspect, which I find very interesting. Illuminating pages have been written about the closeness, the empathy, and the sympathy of Manzoni for the popular masses, which for the first time became the protagonist of a novel. Adopting a contemporary term, we can call Manzoni popular, but certainly I feel very hurt, I still do, 
you and and uh, for this very kind invitation. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Biden. Um, it's particularly important because um, Manzoni um, is a controversial uh, author. It's a controversial What our president, Mattarella, said uh, is not something shared by other politicians. Some members of our uh, current uh, government uh, presented a different kind of Manzoni, a Manzoni that, you know, we, um, the older generations grew up with, Manzoni that was kind of the defender of a, some kind of Catholic piety, family, family values, and so on, and that made it also uh, very outdated as an author. So students are kind of forced to swallow Manzoni, this kind of old-fashioned Manzoni, uh, without really appreciating. And so what the president said in my full uh, translation is really essential, is fundamental, because in rereading Manzoni, um, we not only appreciate you know, the first great Italian novel, but it is also a way of reinterpreting completely what Manzoni actually did. Uh, Manzoni looked at the lower classes. Manzoni looked at the poor. Um, and um, this is something that is not, um, has been kind of beclouded, kind of uh, forgotten, put aside. Um, so it is very important to reread Manzoni. Manzoni, in, in, after you know, a kind invitation, I had a chance to reread Manzoni in uh, your translation. And um, it just came to my mind how important Manzoni was in the tradition of the Italian novel. Uh, other, the, when we talk of the um, um, historical novel, uh, there are different kinds of historical novels. The Italian historical novel, for example, in Sebastiano Vassalli, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the Chimera, uh, the of the Chimera, uh, that is set in the 17th century, like uh, Ippo Messi Sposi, uh, has learned a lot from Manzoni. This dialogue between the I, we talked about it with Michael, the we and the I, the I of the author, and the dialogue that the author establishes between now and the then, that is the 17th century. And also in Vasali the Chimera, the story of which uh, burned, uh, executed by the Catholic Church because she was accused of being a witch. And it's similar in, uh, in uh, the Mrs. Posey. So um, just to start our uh, conversation, um, the ambassador mentioned chapter 19 about, you know, the very interesting conversation. Would you like to say why you are particularly drawn toward that? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I mean, Manzoni is so quotable that whenever I try to find one excerpt or one part, uh, there's like no end to, to his brilliance. And I, I, this is something I discovered later. I mean, while I was translating, I was so focused on form and so focused on language that I was only able to read it as a reader, especially when I was leading an online reading group. And I saw the way people were responding, and I was reading it, and I was startled by what I would find. Uh, when it came to chapter 19, I, I was speaking with the diplomats, and I always try to weave in my personal experiences with my analysis. I somehow think the two are inseparable, and I sometimes think that it is also a um, fault of literary criticism to leave that out, to pretend that there is some objectivity in the way that we evaluate things that is somehow separate from our personal In my case, uh, one of the formative experience of me as an Italian, I mean, there are many, many aspects of it. Uh, I'm even writing now about questions never to ask. I say never to ask me why, because that would take a therapist. <laughs> you know, because there is so much of my life that is in this. But in terms of chapter 19, it is something very central to the novel and central to my experience working at the mission and as an interpreter, where you have to figure out what's going on from the air. Nothing is, I learned working with diplomats and another kind of Italian than the kind of Italian that I learned 
from my friends, which was to be a little bit more indirect, like to, you know, to use the imp to use the um, perfect. What is the word? The si passivant to use the passive much, much more. I always like to mention how um, at the end of the month, when we were receiving our paychecks, they wouldn't say your paycheck is arriving. They would say. I mean, in this very, very abstract language. Could you translate that one? Because that is well, I mean, I didn't hear emulamenti in English Barolo. until accusations of corruption, you know, against a former <laughs> president, you know, because emulamenti in Italian doesn't have quite the negative connotations uh -huh. that it has. So I learned a whole other side of Italian expressions, which helped so much in this chapter, which begins, if you'll allow me, with a note where everything is said between the lines. Nothing is said outright. Everything is insinuated. Everything is implied. And Manzoni begins with this one. Let me see if I can um, quickly. Oh, almost. See, I have things marked off from the various readings that I've done. Anyone who spotted a weed in a in a neglected, just to give you a little background, those of you who know the plot, right, you know that Don Rodrigo has his eye on Lucia, prevents the marriage between Lucia and Enzo from happening. He once, at one point, wants to kidnap her, and so they were forced to escape. And he's so frustrated, he never gives up Don Rodrigo. I mean, um, very perverse kind of anti-hero. Well, not an anti-hero at all, but he's the bad guy. Um, and Don Rodrigo is so frustrated that his cousin, Attilio, who's a real nasty character, right, says, I've got a solution. We'll go to the Count. And he goes to the Count uh, in the previous and talks about the situation of Don Rodrigo. But he, every, he cannot make a direct guess as to what he wants the Count Uncle to do. But he plants in his mind the idea that this one pesky friar, Father Cristoforo, has to be removed. And this is how Manzoni begins that chapter. Anyone who spotted a weed in a neglected field, a nice wild sorrel, say, and wanted to know whether it had come from a seed that had sprouted in the field, was blown in by the wind, or had been dropped there by a bird, would never, no matter how long they pondered it, nor can we say whether it was from the natural depths of his brain or from Attilio's insinuations that the Count Uncle decided to make use of the Father Provincial one by Rodrigo's. You look at these elements, you know, where did this idea come from, right? It says, was it blown in by the wind, sprout in the field, did a bird drop it? Where did this idea come from? Which is very much like sort of the way that you have to plant an idea without without being explicit about it. The fa Father Provincial says, oh, I know what he wants. He wants a favor. Okay. He fathers that moment, too. <laughs> and I asked so many people I worked with, because it's when you interpret, too, often between an Americans and Italian, you're dealing not with just language differences, but culture. And the Italians think that it is rude to be too direct, and Americans are puzzled by people that are too and as an interpreter, you're sort of caught in the middle. And how many times was I in a meeting, and some of you I'm sure can relate, where the Italians would begin in a very roundabout way. Well, I just happened to be in New York, and I wanted to stop by and see my friends at the next, you know, they're talking about the repatriation of suspected works that had been looted. Um, <laughs> and they begin in this roundabout way, and you can see the Americans saying, you want <laughs> what do you want from me? Please tell me. And and as an interpreter, you sort of have to build a bridge between well, the two. You know, this is really part of our tradition. It's the Baroque. You know, the, the Italian prose and the Italian rhetoric is 17th century. And so, you know, in the, uh, I mean, it's kind of being totally indirect and convoluted. But in rereading the chapter, um, there is there are some passages that are déjà vu. In particular, for those of you you know are familiar, reread the after COVID, the part concerning the plague, and all the uh, kind of the wrong interpretations, and go back and remember what the former president said that he could 
bring a bottle of Tide, and they would burn all the <laughs> bad cells. And this is what you see in the 17th century. Um, and, you know, speaking of the beloved former president, he's, here the, um, the count says, and we have been so kind to you. Uh, and you should do, our, do us a favor. And the, you know, Michael translated as follows. I, who have always been so generous to the Capuchin order, to continue to do the good deeds you do in edifying the common people, you priests need peace and quiet, not to mention priests who have family members outside the monastery. So this kind of saying and not saying, you know, I would be really kind of honored to help you, but however, being so kind to you, you remember the conversation with the Ukrainian president. We have been so kind. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, how did you approach the uh, initial, you know, part of the symposium where Manzoni writes in a 17th century style? Yeah, that, one of the things that we do is, uh, as I said, as an interpreter, as a translator, I mean, we see ourselves as communicators, right? Um, so on, on the one hand, there's like the message, right? The content of what is being said, and so we try to unravel things. But there's also something called constructive ambiguity. Again, something that I learned, I think, working at the Italian mission, right? That's very much a part of diplomacy. And um, in this case, I, first of all, I was uh, with that very convoluted opening. And Manzoni's a bit of a tease. You know, he begins the novel with this introduction in this convoluted, uh, I would say, what we call Hispanized Italian, um, Baroque. Um, and these are the first words of a novel that supposedly you're yes. supposed to read. And then you'll read that and you think, oh my God, you know? But he himself then says, basta. You know, he starts reading this manuscript and he says, this is awful stuff, I'm gonna throw it away. Um, but what I had to do in order to, to translate that as well as which is his own invented sort of parody of 17th century right. Hispanized right. Italian. Right. But then he also uses documents. He starts quoting these gride, these decrees that were written. While the Spanish, remember, he's talking about only the state of Milan, and it is under Spanish domination. So Italy, or this part of Italy, is a colony under Spanish rule. So it's not this sort of big independent Italy. And it is a parallel to the Italy in which Manzoni lived, which is under Austria. So I had to sort of figure out what was going on first, and that took a while. And then I had to, it's as if I took, it's as if you ironed a shirt and then you crumpled it up. You know? So I had to recreate the style and make it equally ambiguous. Um, it's particularly striking, I think, in the case of the Greek. There I was very fortunate, and I worked very closely at the mission the legal advisor um, on issues at the Italian mission was particularly concerned with looting, one of the uh, on uh, regarding the protection of cultural heritage and uh, sanctions and things like this. And luckily, he had had a professor that had studied the legislation written during the plague that, using Manzoni. So he was able, because I tried and tried, and, and there were just things that I got wrong. So first I had to figure out what was going on, and then I had to render it in an equal. So it was sort of everything. I think it probably took me just as long to revise the translation as yeah. to translate. What, what, you know, just you mentioned this dialogue between uh, the 19th century Italy under, you know, a colonized, and then a 17th century Italy colonized. And this dialogue that, you know, Manzoni establishes between the past and the present. And um, that made me think about, you know, the status of humanities in Italy in particular. This, I, this idea that, that Manzoni lends it himself very well to uh, this kind of project of reinterpreting, and also thanks to your um, in, uh, tr uh, translation, because um, in many cases in Italian culture, uh, some authors have re-entered the canon for real as real presences, uh, through translations, for example, Primo Levi. The Primo Levi, when I grew up um, in the last century in Rome, Primo Levi was one of the many uh, kind of uh, writers who uh, 
told the terrible, harrowing stories, you know, autobiographical stories. But then after the Primo Levi was appropriated, so to speak, in the American case, then he went back to Italy, and then he became the Primo Levi. So I'm sure, or I hope, that, you know, thanks to your translation, Manzoni will be able to re-enter as a real presence, you know, the, um, the Italian canon. Because at the moment, um, many Italian colleagues, you know, professors, academics, and so on, are wondering uh, how we can possibly reinterpret in the, and inject new life in the Fabian canon. Because to a certain extent, it seems like that modern Italy and what is relevant to the um, younger generations uh, is the 20th century. And what had happened before, maybe you know, five centuries before or just the 19th century, is completely deleted. It doesn't exist. And this is a real problem. There's also, I think, um, one of, I mean, I had so many reasons for doing this, uh, despite my forbidding the question of why. Um, there is so little known uh, about the uh, Italian, about 19th century Italy, uh, which is a focus instead of the et education that you're going to get in Italy. That is the central moment, right, in your study of history, in your study of literature, the type of readers that you might read, the great focus of Manzoni as well. And instead, it's virtually unknown relation out Italy, certainly the United States. I mean, the only 19th century writer that people might is Leopardo, but he just wants to be a poet. And so I thought there was this huge gap in knowledge that Americans have of it. But one of the unexpected, uh, you know, well, well, one of the big surprises and pleasures, I think, in the way that my translation has been received is the way it's being received in Italy. Because, I mean, I talked in the beginning, sometimes I have like a whole PowerPoint thing where I show you the way that the book is actually taught in school. And it's a monstrous thing. Those of you who did it know what I'm talking about. About. You get two or three lines of text, and then you get footnotes. And then you get all these moral lessons about Lucia being a model of femininity, and this is women should be silent and supportive of their crazy husbands, right? Um, you know, like really, well, you know how some people do fit the model, but you know, it's, it's hardly a lesson that I would derive from, from Manzoni. Um, and I've just, I try to show how, first of all, if you look at the way the book was published in its final form in 18. 40, with huge pictures, you know, if you get the chance, this is, I'm, I'm so happy to cover of this because um, we talked for a while, um, what this does is it takes you know, images from the 1840 edition, um, so it takes the image of Lucia and the image of the nun of Monza, but then it sort of repeats them in this kind of like Andy Warhol-like fashion, but it also suggests Lucia with her eyes closed, who's very contemplative and in perspective. The nun of Monza, with her eyes open, who's very wary, and who does look ominous, I guess, sinful, and she does meet a terrible end. Um, and really, I think, um, as I mention this, I'm just thinking another aspect of Bantoni that doesn't receive enough attention is his portrait of women. I mean, he portrays women in an extraordinary way for any age, but I think it's really unprecedented. The inner lives of women, the way that women, for particularly in the case I would say of the Nana Monza, the kind of coercion to which she was subject, the way she was forced into the convent step by step by step by step, something that is very difficult for Americans to understand. Because when I was leading this reading group, I don't know if uh, uh, any of you have had this type of experience. As Americans, we we believe very much in decisions and choices, right? I mean, and it's all about choice. And you go to the supermarket and you have too many choices, right? And some of the readers are saying, well, why did she choose to become a nun? And I was like, how could you even ask that question? This has nothing to do with it. She is, it, she is forced into that role. I think that Italian and Latin, I would say Latin America as well, and other cultures believe, are much more fatalistic. And what is unique about American culture, what is both good and bad about it, I think, is this skeptic of fatalism, belief we can change our fate, change our world. And in that sense, maybe Renzo, most American character in the novel. Getting back to the question, which I've almost forgotten <laughs> in my long answer, um, about, uh, I wanted to emphasize 
that this is a novel that should be read to be accessible. It should be fun to read. And one of the things that I noticed um, in the way Italians have reviewed my translation and in the way that conferences I went to, the way they started talking about the novel, is to say we need to go back to it being a novel and we need to go back to all that is fun. Because believe me, it's all fun. And, you know, um, um, the, the idea that, you know, the American psyche is about choice and so on and so forth. I had this kind of problem years ago when I had to teach these kinds of Because there, you also have a situation of this woman, you know, walking around in this car of And I was teaching a class for, you know, continuing education at night. People would tell me, why didn't she leave? And I was like, you know, I was speechless because I didn't quite know what to make, how to make sense of this. I think that, you know, there is a way of relating to, um, you know, the uh, profile, the character of Monica di Monza uh, by um, placing her in her, you know, historical context. And also from an American uh, standpoint, women were also, you know, compelled to get married or embrace some kind of lifestyle that was not really a choice. So I constantly, you know, I try, when I'm translating, I try to hear the language. I listened to recordings of this. I listened to a lot of Verdi also. You know, Verdi's great Requiem Mass, you might have written for Manzoni oh, the yeah. year after. And I also try to visualize what is being, you know, I really like, I have a new novel to do, and I realize, mentioning it earlier, um, something modern and something short. Um, and uh, the, the author is from Martina Frank in Puglia. And I realize, you know what, I have to go there. I can't translate the novel with I had the fortune to live in Milano, and live, so that helped very much. Um, in doing dialogue, I tried to imagine it being read or spoken by people that I actually I didn't want it to sound still artificial. And I wanted each character to have their own voice, which they do. Tony, I don't think that's recognized enough. Some critics have accused him of putting, of putting Florentine in the mouths of Lombard peasants. But if you know the way that they speak, around Como and around uh, Milano as well, you hear those tones. There was a figure in Grizzo who at one point says, they do the, you know, which is, oh, Danese, you know, and I can hear that. Um, so in the case of the Monica, I lived in Munich for a while. I was studying German. I was at a boarding house. It was attended by people that were going to the International Youth. Um, and this one woman came. She was American. We hung out. We went to the opera together and spoke. And then one evening, she said, have you ever noticed anything? Like, guessing games, right? You know? Um, and I said, yes. I said, you, you talk a lot about your life, but there's like a 10-year period that... And she said, I used to be a nun. And she, the way she talked about becoming a nun was so similar to the Monica de Mont. Basically, she was the youngest of a large family. In a large family, you want one religious person to warm the bench up in heaven, right? You know? <laughs> and she was, her mother would take her to church, and it was just simply assumed, from the, it was implanted in her that she was to become a nun. And it wasn't until years later, adult, when she was a nun, and when her best friend left, suddenly she realized that that possibility opened. It wasn't quite the violence the monk but it was very real. There was no distance from what was described by Manzoni from, that, from the experience. Maybe we could open, you know, the conversation over here if they have questions. Uh, could you wait for the mic, just so that, uh, since this is. Simple question. Did you consult the first edition of the novel? Did I consult, excuse first me? Ed first, first edition. edition. Um, you know, I do have tons of commentaries, first of all. My biggest problem was finding a good comment, because the ones for school were just useless. I have the, I do have the 1820s. When you say the first edition, you mean the 18, the Vinti Setana, right? The 
27, or do you mean like even earlier the Ferbe Lucia, the unpublished? The one, the one, the one that was published for yeah, the 1827. Uh, yes and no. I mean, I have what they call this Edizione Interlineare, which shows you the 1827 edition, and then between the lines, the changes it makes on each. I didn't do that initially, but in translating an author like Manzoni, there is so much scholarship. We call it a rabbit hole. Like, there's a risk that as you start researching something, you're never to. And the type of research that I had to do in order to translate this was not so much the research that a scholar would do, it's the research that a translator would do, which is finding the right words, finding a good commentary. Um, I used the Plecani online dictionary, which was sort of puzzling because every time I found a word that Manzoni used in a particular way, he beat a bond, which is a tricky word. I mean, you could, there's a part of me that would like to sort of retranslate certain parts in a more outrageous way, because there is language that's really kind of over the top. Monster scoundrels, right? But I just felt like, hey, scoundrels nowadays, right? So I use it, they can't, but whenever they use an example to illustrate the meaning of a word, the example comes. So a lot, and then finding the right English words. So, so much of my focus really just, and that was, you know, I mean, I've done, you know, certainly, I, and I did find a good commentary, actually, uh, based upon a negative review of a friend who said, oh, this Feltinelli edition is terrible. So I went, I got it, of course. And it was perfect. You know, it was a Gedetti, and it had exactly the kind of footnotes that I needed. It gave me, of a particularly difficult sentence, it would give me a paraphrase of a word that was a little bit odd. And then he would also mention differences between the things he said on it. Um, recently, in Milano, they had a special um, exhibit at the Bredense Library where you have all of Manzoni's papers collected. And there I saw something that really caught my attention, which was Manzoni's own edition of the Vendicetana, his handwritten correction. There's a portale, you know, there's a website, Manzoni. I think it's called manzoni.org. And there you will find, it's incredible. They have, it's stuff that I like. It's kind of nerdy, I guess, on my part. But there you find manuscripts. You find the handwritten corrections of the people that sort of further Tuscanized his 1827 version. Um, it's a really remarkable kind of um, resource and, and picture, really, of Manzoni. Uh, his Good evening. Thank you so much. This is like <laughs> so. I um I was educated in Italy and I went to film school one day in Israel. But um after forty years, when COVID stopped, I couldn't find Manzoni. I, I other big book, but and I recommended it to my book for all Americans. They were a little skeptical about it, and when they read it, they still after all this well, these two years or three years, they still bring that up as one of the best they have ever. So I am just very, very grateful because you have uh you're helping uh the American public and but he I mean I'm even talking about my brother in Denmark. Now he can finally read this book. You're gonna open the eyes to so many people and I could not believe how much relates to today, uh, especially with COVID and the hoarding of flour and the stress that people go through and, and uh, the suspicion uh, that everybody's going through and all that. I mean, we had the same problem. And uh, to relive that, but understanding that this was centuries ago, is really to understand better how human mankind is and the importance of learning from history. So I just want to just thank you so much because this is just going to be uh, an eye opener for so many people. And it's written, I read it without the footnotes and I just read it as a novel. And I was so, I would read it a third time. Oh, great. Thank you for saying that. You know, I have to say, as I've been, when I was lead, leading, read, when I was leading this book club, I would have to every day have like, we read it, it was, they were promoting slow reading. And they've begun during the pandemic with War and Peace. You know, and I always said, I want Manzoni to be in the same 
that's where he belonged. And that every review that came out put him right in that company, so I was very pleased. But in this reading group, you know, um, I had to pick out like every day three excerpts, maybe three illustrations. And I was amazed, reading it as a reader, how perfectly written. How I wouldn't, even though it's long, uh, even though it has its digressions, which aren't really digressions, it's a perfectly written novel. It's so carefully written. Every single sentence both sort of refers to something that has just happened and sort of looks forward to and encaps encapsulates the great themes of the novel, which in addition, before this awful pandemic that we just went through, I had thought that the real tema por tanto, you know, the, the mainstay of the novel, was its discussion of justice. The social injustice is very much a concern of especially in those chapters of the plague, when we look at his background and where he came from, I mean, his grandfather wrote the first court tract against punishment. His uncle, Tate Rivedi, wrote against torture. In the succession to this, he talked about torture. And there's very much a concern with social inequality, with the fact that the rich, as we see in the very first chapters, get away with murder. You know, um, they have all these gride written to prevent these thugs, these parabi, from doing what they want and how the poor are completely subjected to uh, the whims of the law, the poor being also illiterate. For the most part, this is something that torments uh, Benzo. This is something that runs through the novel, through the whole discourse on literacy versus illiteracy. I think it was what moved people so much when I spoke in, in Toronto, where you had many more new immigrants from Canada who had had that experience of sort of coming at a young age and knowing their home dialect, but not knowing Italian, of feeling oppressed by standard Italian, in addition to the problem of immigrants which spoke a language. No. So this is a very, very central aspect of it. It just runs through the novel. It should be, like, you know, completely revised the way we are. It should be sent a message uh, promoter of this injustice is really no, no, I didn't hear. Well, she, she was she part was of it, right? Yeah. And Sony. Oh, the wife. The wife. The wife. The yes, a Calvinist. <laughs> Blondel. Enriqueta Blondel, yes. She was part of Sorry. Um, it was very much a part of Manzoni's family, though, right? Um, in terms of the wife, her family almost disinherited her for converting to Catholicism. But the kind of Catholicism to which Manzoni subscribed was a Jansenism. It was almost like a Calvinist form of, of you know, it wasn't Italian Catholicism where kind of anything goes and you confess on Saturday, right? Um, it, was, <laughs> right. Um, it was stricter, more like Irish Catholicism maybe, where you're just not <laughs> supposed to do anything bad, right? Um, and you'll go to hell. Um, anyway, so, um, so there is that sort of um, wrinkle in the way that he talks about. I think that it's overemphasized, though. When they talk about when you ask an Italian what is a novel about, they will always tell you, La Divina Providenza, right? right? I was once told by an Italian poet that Americans could never understand the Promessi Sposi, perché non capisco la Divina Providenza. And I said, I was born in Providence. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not divine, I, but right? <laughs> no, it wasn't divine, right? But I mean, I talk about a country that was built on religion. No, I mean, so many communities in America were founded by different religious sects. So that was sort of the, the, the least of our difficulties. But there is so much that is not divine. It's very, contra it's, it's strange in Manzoni, the whole thing. Because it is true there are these moments of conversion, right? When the nameless one is converted. Then you start talking about providence. But Renzo does not depend on providence at all. And even though Manzoni brings up providence again at the very end of the novel, He's always ironizing. So um, he'll say one thing, but then he'll show another. And there's this, you know, these two things going on all the time of maybe what his beliefs are, but then there's what the novel does. I describe back. 
that question I can answer. Um, I, th I think that many Italian professors in America assigned the betrothed to their students in an English translation, the Penguin, which is still available, not realizing how boring it is. I mean, it's really, it's longer than the original. He tends to explain things, and none of the lyricism or the beauty of the language comes through. And I just felt like, and people were wondering why this disconnect happened and why didn't Americans appreciate the betrothed. And I always just said, because it hasn't been translated very well. Because one of the most beautiful and attractive parts of the novel is, of course, its language. And, you know, in Italy, you talk about your deformazione professionale, and mine as a translator is language. When I'm reading Italian, I'm reading, I'm drawn in by the language. You know, you start to, you don't care so much about the plot or the characters or anything, but is that language interesting? Does it, in, does it draw you in? Is it inventive? You know, and I, and I felt that that was really missing from the other um, versions. And I thought it needed an American version, you know, and by a Catholic in the sense that I had all of that church upbringing. I had all those prayers in my head and that attitude to the language. Because when you're a Catholic, and I don't want, I'm not saying this to convert anyone, but the, but the fact that we believe in the mystery, the fact that we believe in the transubstantiation or talk of it, I think affects our, lang our attitude toward language. This idea that it should be mysterious, something mysterious, and that language has to be And I think one of the things, sometimes when I'm translating, I'm almost afraid to finish it, because I'm afraid of bringing it, because I want it to keep that sort of aura. One, one question uh, that I had you answer in your note, the syntax, because speaking of mystery, really like I suppose he opens with a, that beautiful description of Blake uh, and uh, those long, long sentences, and you address that problem. It's not, it doesn't work. It does, you know, the truth is it doesn't even work in Italian. I mean, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I was asked this question um, in Milano a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was this long passage that I had broken into three. I want to say why. And she read the Italian, and I said, did you notice that you paused at exactly those moments where I put in a false period? Um, so some, some of what I had to do had to do with, in, in Italian, the use of semi Yes. In older, maybe not so much now where Italian is so influenced by English, but you know, when you had the same subject with semi you wouldn't have a period. You would have a semicolon. Yes. You, and the idea of a period in Italian used to be like violent, like the end, right? That's the end of this musical piece. It doesn't have that same heaviness in, um, in English. Should I read? Is oh, that please, please. Oh, yeah, that yes. Over? Um, you know, when I was, in, I presented in Lecco, and they just kept asking me to read and read and read, because they loved hearing, to, to see whether or not Manzoni's rhythms came through. The branch of Lake Como that turns south between two unbroken mountain chains, bordered by coves and inlets that echo the furrowed slope, suddenly narrows to take the flow and shape of a river between a promontory on the right and a wide shoreline on the opposite side. The bridge that joins the two sides at this point seems to make this transformation even more visible to the eye and mark the spot where the lake ends and the oddity. To reclaim the name lake, shores newly distant allow the water to spread and slowly pool into fresh inlet. I think to sort of follow the Italian, I think it, it, you know, I worked very, very long on that part. Thank you so much for this conversation. I think it's showing how much we can learn even from one single work of literature, which is fantastic. And it makes me think of an article that was in the Washington Post recently about the decline of education in the humanities and how the STEM education is becoming so much more, more prevalent. And we've also seen other things about the decline of education in foreign languages in this country, but with the exception of a couple of languages, like Spanish, but Italian, which is not the so I wonder if you could comment a little bit about what you think of the future of education. Uh, I'll 
to start because there was a big article in the New Yorker about that, which was fascinating. It was comparing Arizona State University to Harvard, and it was just talking about how cut some state universities also in and how private industry was stepping in, building these buildings on campus, students were then automatically attracted to. But it saw an increase in two one in people doing AP English, and two in returning students, adults who were going back to university and they didn't want to learn about it. They wanted the more expensive. Well, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm glad that that of the state of speak on the situation. At the moment, you know, we were talking to my colleague a few minutes before beginning this event. Uh, no, the, um, um, the uh, humanities departments just for in the, I don't know, in Italy, but the U.S., they are shrinking as we speak. And, uh, and, and years ago, um, we were supposed to be um, special where you need to be really very good in one thing. Today, instead, our students and future colleagues must be able to juggle multiple disciplines because, uh, because universities, colleges want them to be able to do multiple things so that they can save money. Uh, and so, but, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't see a bright future right way. But I guess what Mike makes a lot of sense with the system of old age. You know, you, you go to, <laughs> you get to. <laughs> Who you call an old, right? <laughs> um. Dr. Moore, thanks so much. Um, uh, a book person. But I, I'd like to know more about the Verity. Because, you know, they're. Been that um, Manzoni, absolutely, absolutely. Senator for life. I mean, he and Bev they both sort of share the status of being the sort of artist patriot of the 19th century. Great believers you know, in the unification of Italy. You know how Verdi they said that his name really stood for V E R D I, Vittorio Emanuele, Re Italia, right? You know. Um, and uh, so I th and I think Verdi worshipped Manzoni for you know the the fresco that Manzoni had created of Italian society. There are some who say that the passage that I will read at Addio ai Monti was also the basis for the great chorus we find in Verdi Nabucco, which many Italians believe should be La yeah. Pensiero. That there you do hear those rhythms. So there's a great affinity. They're both Northerners, of course. Um, but I think um, I see their commonality in that one. Also in, um, you know, some of Verdi's lesser known operas like I Lombardi, La Prima Crociata, this is from Tommaso Grossi, who quoted here. I mean, he's also very interested in northern Italy. There are some plots of this. Bad people are always in Spain, in his case, right? And you've got to find a foreign country to bring evil people. Um, but I mean, when he, he's very interested in northern Italian history as is, as is uh, And also, I have to say, the way that the novel is structured reminds me of Bob. Um, it's not written like a, a novel with a sort of continuous plot. You have, and I u always use the example of Ballard Mosque, which is special to me for many But you find, you know, when Leonora is going to meet her lover, where else? Cemetery, right? Um, so she comes and she says, Keori do campo. You know, she sort of arrives and she's all scared. And then along comes Enrico and he sings. She gets an aria, he gets an aria, they do a duet together. Then in come the townspeople, and you get the concertato, then you get the, I mean. And this goes on in the way that um, Manzoni also structured. He quotes opera extensively. He quotes, you know, uh, Rossini, Dicchi Dicchi Piano Piano. So even someone was pointing out recently, even the story of the lovers is somewhat reminiscent of Masetto and Figaro. Uh, there's a lot of in month, but uh, and thank 
interesting. This is so interesting to me because um, I'm actually a student of neurolinguistics and syntax. So what you were saying earlier about syntax is really fascinating. Um, and I actually had a question about kind of like the phonological translation and that side of things. Um, and I was wondering as a translator, how you account for phonological, like the phonological effect of certain words in the original language on the reader in the translated language and like the ratio of consonants to vowels, which seems to me like an impossible task. So how, how do you go about that? If I were to be analytical about it, it would fall apart. I mean, I depend on my ear. Um, an example I could use is the very first word of the first chapter, which in Italian is quel, quel ramo del lago. And literally that would be that. I'm like, that, quel, very different sound. So I said the. And so I really aimed to create instinctively what I thought were very liquid sounds. Uh, and some people, you know, deep L at this point could translate almost anything. It's pretty amazing. It's frightening almost how accurate it is for a lot of doctors. But it doesn't have an ear. So I think that I really, you know, it's more instinctive than anything, but it is going beyond the idea of a literal translation. Rather than I didn't think so much in the terms that you have um, posed, although I, I think that was definitely going on. I find that one of the things that happens with someone like Manzoni is he writes very memorable sentences that in Italian stick to your head. And that Italians usually ask me, how did you do this sentence? They all remember certain sentences. They say, quel matrimonio non sa da fare, exactly. right? They say, la sventura di the spose. They always say, how did you translate that one? Well, first sentence you can say that that marriage is going to happen. I said, I said, that marriage ain't going to happen. Yes. I was, you know, um, and I, I actually, this, this morning I wrote a I was going to ask you, yeah. so I do remember, because of the few things that, yeah. you know, Italian students remember, they, that matrimonio non sa da fare. Yeah. And, uh, okay. You, and that, first thing. of all, I've always wanted to use the word ain't in translation. I mean, we do have that, you know, we, we look at words and expressions and we collect them, and I say, I'm dying to use that, like, regardless of what says. But in this case, it was two thugs. And it was a memorable sentence. And so I knew I had to do something. It's funny because I was, uh, there was just a review of the translation in the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement in English. Um, and it was, it began very nicely and then it attacked me for being too colloquial. And so I just wrote a really nasty letter. Because um, <laughs> I'm really happy with what I did, you know. Um, and she said, oh, it's too, you know, it, it gets too slangy. And I said, no, this is a sentence that is so memorable that it had to be daring translation. I had to come up with a sentence that stuck in your mind just the way that is. So I did not only that, not only the ain't, but then I added the double negative. Not now, not ever. Believe me, these are, you could, I, I spent a long time on some of these sentences because it just had to sound right. That, that, that sentence is a very direct kind of statement, not really what they're coming No, because those are the thugs, right? They speak more directly. As you get lower, you know, the language gets clearer. Just out of curiosity, what are the other options that you see for that one? For that? I mean, if you just so this marriage isn't going to happen. I mean, and I'm just like, isn't this sounded damn right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and this is threatening, you know? So it just had to have that. So I think People the ain't got in there. No, that would have been a little too slangy for me. To say okay. ain't happened, that would have been very content. What I did, uh, I looked up words. I wanted it to be modern English, but not contemporary, not 21st century, even though sometimes the feeling is that. I you know, want that feeling to be there, but sort of dial it back just a little bit. And I would look the Merriam-Webster Dictionary online. I don't know how we or Google. The online dictionary tells you the first date. And so, you know, if, you know, so for the most part, you know, I would go up to maybe 1950. I didn't want things. I wanted words that were still in use in English today, but that had a, that is a. <laughs> fun doing this job, but I'm sure it also took you quite a while because if you're wondering, to so, so many versions you think about. I also, I'm guessing about you as you, as 
some affinity with music. This, so really, it doesn't just take an interpreter or a translator job, but to be a musical person, have a sense of humor. Definitely, the humor helped. I think um, being from a family of storytellers helps. You know, I mean, we I'm from a large family, and we had to entertain my father in the evening with stories. <laughs> And that always involved, you know, a little bit of irony. The family of also Irish American, we were very proud of our eloquence and wordplay and stuff like that. But I think that also my experience as an interpreter has been very important because then you you just kind of instinct sort of trying to figure out what something. Is. When I translate, I don't like to stop and look at the word. I like to get to the end of the sentence, and that enables me to try to capture gist of being, what's being said, but also cadence that speech. And then I go back to what So that I think might be the way other things work. And I translated a lot of Fountain Pen for a couple of reasons. One, because it sort of put me in that mode. You know, and I feel like when I'm writing by hand, I'm writing sentence. And I was trained by the nuns. I would, and I was not allowed to go to recess because I couldn't do M's. The name like Michael Moore, that was a bit of an issue. And I remember being on the blackboard doing M, 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 M. Um, so I came from that generation that did have penmanship training and using a fountain pen. It was just sort of beautiful. So you might even fool yourself into thinking that your sentence is beautiful just because it looks nice on the page. But since I also did a part of the translation uh, in Bellagio at the Rockefeller Foundation, right on Lake Como, which is beautiful. If I was staring at the computer, I'm staring at the computer. By writing by hand, whenever I look up, I think these various elements also. My previous training, though, had been in painting, sculpture, rather than in music. Music is just there, I think, in terms of the cadence of the speech, I think. but otherwise, it's very visual. My memory of the Promessi Sposi is that that you mentioned uh, studying in it's, it's a book that very had by professors. And especially I remember the fact that my impression was that of a novel composed by two totally unremarkable protagonists surrounded by a cast of amazing side characters. So I was really interested in um, knowing how you develop the voices for those characters in particular. Well, in terms of Lucia doesn't have much of a voice, right? She doesn't speak most of the novel, except at the end, right? When she says, you know, Toba came looking for me. Um, so there's those beautiful interior monologues. Lenzo has a very strong voice. I didn't find him difficult. I think um, the characters that I find so memorable, I always say someone should write all of them. She has all this wisdom. She has a voice, and she's always trying to find solutions. Uh, and I would imagine Agnès in Perpetua. That's such a great scene. The whole day, La Notte de Limbrogli, where all this stuff goes on. I remember reading it at a residence. It sounds just like so we're just, you know, there's this, all this, like, keystone on where kidnapping is going on, and the bell starts ringing, and no one knows really what's going on. And at the end, of start, but when Agnese decides she needs to get Perpetua out of the way so that the young couple can go up and try to get married um, just by present in front of the priest and exchanging their vows without him. And she just starts saying, well, I was just in this other town. They were talking about you and Beppe Swalovecchia and these names. And stuff. That was fantastic. And I remembered John. Busy and you know an older generation first of all that didn't swear very important that an older generation never lords and so that sort of worked pretty well with them and they like like to keep busy they would I remember once one aunt she whole bag of rags basically what they did was they made rag rugs they would braid the rags together sew them but it was so they could talk you know so they were just talking talking. Talk and talk and talk and work. 
And I just thought of their voices so much. I thought of real and whether these words would come out of it. So I would translate it literally the way that it was. Uh, but especially, another aside, I've done work with subtitles. And when you subtitle a film, you have a small amount of space to communicate. And after doing subtitling, I went back and I looked at all of the dialogue to make sure that the that I'd paid enough attention to what happened back and whether or not that language was appropriate. That so, but I did want to imagine, I never wanted it, to, when I, I would say it was Americans, because for some reason, whenever movies are made about Romans or about the Medici, about Italy, in, 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 it's always with British actors. You know, like somehow that makes more sense. And it doesn't necessarily, I didn't want it to be still that way. How did how did that I mean from process begin, evolve? From beginning to end, it was twenty years, but I wasn't working just on this. You're good. Um, but what helped really were all of the interruptions that maybe upset the editors, but that made me a better translator. Because you know, there were so one of the things that helped me the most actually was a funny novel. Never had any funny. Uh, it was called Esky Live Cake by a young writer named Bob. And if you're ever in Italy and you get a chance to hear him speak, well, he's hysterical, funny, crazy. And he was talking about crummy town near Pisa. It sounded just like crummy, which, you know, where basically the plug has been pulled out and all they do is sell meth. Um, and it was so easy to relate, but he was so much fun to work with. And since it was a novel which, with a lot of humor, I had to translate it in a very different way, in a freer way. And so after doing that, I went back to the Manzoni with a much figuring what I had done was if somehow that helped. So I'd done my due diligence doing the sort of the literal translation part, but then doing something like that made me go back, loosen it up, shake it. Now when I go, now when I'm translating new stuff, my whole approach is changed. Um, I did make a mistake. I mean, a friend who had translated uh, Don Quixote said, after each chapter, revise it. And I was impatient to be done, believe it or not. Um, and I revised at the end. But if I had revised at the end of each chapter, like she recommended, then I think I would have refined my method sooner. But, you know, I did it the way I did. I'm happy. And also the fact that I did it when I did it, sort of an amazing coincidence. I mean, to be suddenly listening to the radio and hearing about the pandemic, social distancing, suddenly, you know, what might have seemed very far away, those chapters 31 to 34, were very, very present, and I had to look at them again. Of course, finishing when I did, 150th anniversary of Manzoni's death, not have been more to it, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. If there are no more questions, uh, I would leave the floor to you for the final remarks. And thank you very much. Yeah, I, especially tonight, you know, since this is a conclusion of a long series of talks novel that have taken me from New York to Washington another time, Philadelphia, Boston, then Milano, Roma, Echo, San Francisco. Santa Barbara, Toronto, now Washington. I like to include always in passage, but it has a special meaning for me.
farewell mountains, rising from the waters and reaching to the sky. Jagged peaks familiar to one who has grown up among you, etched in her mind no less clearly than the faces of those. Farewell rivers, whose roaring she knows as well as the voices of men. Farewell small white villages clinging to the slope like flocks of grazing sheep. Nothing could be sadder than the footsteps of one who, having grown up among you, must never leave. Such a moment crushes the fantasies of a man who departs freely, dreaming of seeking his fortune elsewhere. Dismayed to have ever resolved such a thing, he would turn back, but for his dreams of wealth. The more he advances across the plain, the more his weary eyes are repelled by the unending sameness. The air feels heavy and Dejected and confused, he enters the tumultuous city, unable to breathe among, unable to breathe amid house after house, street, standing before buildings admired by many a foreigner, he thinks with restless desire the field in his home. The little house that caught his eye long ago, which he will buy once he returns to his mountain. Well, but what about a girl? who has never nursed even a fleeting desire to leave who has pictured her future in that set born in a single moment from her most cherished habit. She leaves the mountains behind, following the foot of strangers she had no wish to see, unable to even imagine the moment she might return. Farewell, childhood home, we're lost in private thought. She had learned to hear the difference between normal footsteps and the footsteps of the youth she awaited with mysterious fear. Farewell home she might never know, at which she had stolen many a blushing The home she had envisioned a marriage, serene and Farewell church, where peace of mind had so often returned while singing the Lord's praises. For her marriage bands, where the secret yearning of her heart was solemnly blessed and love for He who gave you such I would never trouble the joy of his children, except more certain. was wonderful so thank you again thank you uh, all for joining us and um, if you have any additional questions maybe we have a few minutes to chat later uh, but again thank you so much for coming